Okay, thanks. I'm going to try to switch between this and maybe the microphone, so let me know if you can't hear me. How many people here work with dairy farmers? Okay, how many people are dairy farmers? Okay, that'd be helpful. Okay, um, so I just wanted to share what we've been learning on our um, long-term cropping system project. We finished our eighth year, um, both in terms of the goals that overlap very much with climate resilience and sustainability, as we've heard earlier, are the terms and other ways to frame climate adaptation um, from earlier speakers. And this, I think you'll see, um, has a lot of themes that we're all working towards that many farmers identify with and that they're being regulated for. And also in light of what Sarah said, if you heard Sarah in the e earlier session, are the profitability challenges that are very real right now. So um, this project is really a team effort. There are multiple faculty and extension staff in many disciplines. We have soil scientists, weed scientists, entomologists, uh, dairy scientists, ag engineer, dairy financial management, extension educators, um, crop scientists, and many graduate students have been involved over the years. Um, uh, about 12, uh, we have currently some students. We've had a number of postdocs who really are the project managers and key to this. There's a lot of technical support and um, undergraduate research systems. I counted, I think there were 35 so far because it's been running for eight years. And ARS is one of our major collaborators, as I hope you saw in our earlier slide, uh, as well as the funding has been with Northeast Sarah and Penn State. So um, let's just give it a little bit of context. The typical Pennsylvania and Northeast dairy farm tends to grow all their forages. Um, in Pennsylvania, that's very typically corn silage and alfalfa with a grass or orchard grass. Um, sometimes they have that uh, cover crop after the corn silage. They might follow it with a rye cover crop. Um, and of course, there are different types of perennial forages, perennial mixes they might use. But um, the reality is that with this type of model, that had worked when commodities were relatively you know, lower cost, readily available, and could be uh, imported, and, and, and in some cases, fertilizers too. Um, and so here's another way of this schematic. And just to clarify, so this schematic shows a six-year crop rotation starting in uh, the end of January, right? And you see corn silage being planted in the spring in May, and then December is the dotted line through to the next year of January. Okay, so that's the first year in this schematic. Then there's nothing covering the soil if they don't use a cover crop from when they harvest it, usually around early September, until next May when they plant another corn silage crop, unless they use a cover crop. So we see here three years of corn silage where I've put in a cover crop, um, and then followed by, in this case, two years of alfalfa and orchard grass, okay? Another way of thinking about this is this simplified picture gram of what the typical uh, Northeast dairy farm produces. Typically, 75% of those nutrients that the dairy cows produce is left in the manure, and about 25% is exported, okay? So the reality is that if we look at what might be a typical, at the time we started this project, average size dairy farm, there's 65 milking cows on about 120 acres, or, four, or this 49 hectares. And they're bringing in feed to supplement the ration, which means there's an accumulation of nutrients on the farm, on that footprint of land, and there's high potential for nutrient losses, you know, phosphorus runouts, nitrogen leaching, and ammonia volatilization, um, as well as soil loss. So the good news is, you know, this is one of our goals, is to reduce nutrient and soil losses in this project, which is really a goal, as you see, um, really important with climate change. Um, in Pennsylvania, about 67% of farmers are no-till farmers, so they don't use tillage. So our project has been primarily a no-till project, um, but that means if you're a dairy farmer, your manure is left on the soil surface, where it can run off, and phosphorus can, loss can be higher, ammonia volatilization can be high, and that comes back down in the watershed, right? It doesn't just disappear and not affect water quality. 
So we have been looking at using manure injection, which is a relatively innovative practice in, in a lot of the Northeast, to reduce those losses, to help farmers conserve those nutrients and protect water quality. Um, and you know, once they go to no-till, that means they tend to rely more on herbicides, especially if they use cover crops and perennials, because they can't use tillage to terminate them. Um, and that also means that um, there's a cost associated with that, but they can at least purchase less fuel using no-till, and if they inject the manure, we've definitely found they can reduce the need for side dress nitrogen. So these numbers are the first six years. Uh, if we add in another year of the data, over um, seven years, we found that we could reduce the amount of side dress nitrogen if we inject the manure, so conserve that ammonium and not have it volatilize off, um, by about this 100 kilograms, now it's about 80 kilograms, um, you know, that's about 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre, or about 33%. So this is a practice and a strategy that we are using in this project, and I want you to keep in mind that this is one of these ideally best management practices. However, it does tend to increase nitrous oxide emissions, especially when there's precipitation af soon after injecting manure. Um, but the quantity that's lost as nitrous oxide is relatively small, but that's an important greenhouse gas. So that's a bit of a challenge. Okay, so let's frame this now thinking about climate change. So my thinking is that some of the biggest challenges from what I've seen in the eight years of doing this and that we've heard about from farmers here are these increased winter precipitation events as rain, more fall rain, more spring, early spring rain. Um, more even in the winter as rain, and higher temperatures in midsummer. So we've got the challenge of more potential for erosion and nutrient losses, more nitrogen mineralization with warmer climate, and more potential for losses. We're going to have difficulty, and we've already experienced it, as we heard from others, in timely planting in the spring with wet soils, and also in harvesting when the falls are rainy. Um, and if you have spring crops that you're harvesting, like winter annuals, that can be challenging. Oops, going the wrong way, sorry. Um, we see some young, summer stress and heat stress that we've heard about from others, and also the real challenge of more pests as they increase their growth rates with warmer temperatures and as they survive over winter and as they move north more, and particularly with diseases. So these forage crops can have very significant impacts of lower quality if there's a lot of fungal, fungal diseases molds um, and high moisture and warm conditions are great for many of these diseases and I've talked to dairy farmers who say they're really having problems with high quality forage because of, of some of these kinds of diseases. We also have then the potential for more slugs because slugs like cool wet conditions that are more common in spring, weeds. Okay, how about the positives? Well, we've heard a little bit about this and yes, we have now longer spring and fall um, and so the potential for more production, particularly of those cool season crops, um, there may be some more benefit for longer, warmer seasons as you go north. And I like to think that maybe eventually the economy and the milk uh, opportunities will improve because the West is gonna have a tough time without enough dry, without, with, without enough water, but that's maybe too optimistic, we'll see. Okay, so what are some of the strategies? Well, we've heard a little bit from other folks um, our strategies actually fit well with our cropping systems. Trying to have more year-round cover and crop production more year-round with more diverse crops, utilize those early springs and, and falls, keep the soil covered continuously, improve soil structure, all the practices that you, know, you hear about with soil health. Keep live roots in the soil, return more organic matter, um, minimize tillage, all of those things, and tie up that manure and use it to grow a crop not just a cover crop. That's one of our big um, findings and, and goals in helping farmers think about it, this double cropping that you hear about. Co conservation agriculture includes all these things as well as crop rotation. That's a big uh, opportunity, I think, to keep helping people think about um, and all the benefits that come with all these practices, uh, including spreading out the harvesting and planting seasons over the year so we're not trying to do everything in the spring. If it's a wet, cool spring and you've got all your crops to plant, you know, that's really putting all your eggs in one basket or one time frame, and, and that's going to have a lot of challenges. So it, quickly in our project, we have two six-year diverse crop rotations that essentially are designed to have a continuous cover, 
um, and we use IPM. We do not use BT in the corn. We do not have any seed neonicotinoid treatments that are the new rage now that the seed companies are putting on all of the grain crops because we do not want those neonics to harm beneficial insects. And we've found, uh, um, a graduate student in entomology found that that was having tritrophic interactions. It was basically not killing the slugs, which are the biggest pests in these no-till systems, but it was toxic to the predatory beetles. And so we have eliminated uh, those treatments, which is not even easy to do with seed dealers, but we're doing it. Um, and we also have double crops, cover crops, perennials. We have a control comparison I won't get into a lot, but that has all the preemptive standard um, pest control strategies. So here's an example of one of the rotations, um, and we've actually slightly modified it in the last two years now, that crimson clover after sorghum sudan grass is now another rye silage. But basically what we are doing is diversifying, trying to do more double cropping. So this rye silage is um, double crop after corn silage, followed by sorghum sudan grass, um, which has some more drought tolerance. It uh, interrupts pest life cycles. And then we have had used crimson clover, but we also use another rye silage after that. Uh, Penn State has developed a cover crop interseeder that allows us or enables us to establish cover crops in corn grain because it's too late usually to plant cover crop after corn grain is harvested, so we interseed it. Okay, so this gives us all these kinds of goals that we're trying to achieve. We also have data here about the benefits of how much forage we can produce when we harvest rye silage, and this, can, this has varied for us over the years, but on average you see this uh, well, this is in metric tons, but uh, maybe 3.5 drop tons per acre of dry matter, which is about 9.7 at 65% moisture content rye silage. Um, and that's really great forage for dry cows and heifers, which we were finding we needed on the farm. And we use that manure that farmers have to spread in the fall to grow more forage. Um, we also have another rotation where we've integrated soybeans for more feed and winter canola so we can double crop, use manure in the fall that the farmers have to get out there, they have to empty out their six-year manure storage in the fall on winter canola. We use the oil for a straight vegetable oil tractor and then we use the meal to substitute for a high-protein grain like soybean meal. Um, and that diversifies the crop rotation again for pest control and spreads our times of harvest and planting over the seasons better. So I, I think we all know about all the benefits of, of soil health. Um, here's water stable aggregate increase each year in uh, perennial alfalfa and orchard grass. So that was a significant increase after just two years. Um, lots of opportunities to benefit soil health from these kinds of practices. We also find that this is great, especially alfalfa, for habitat for predatory insects beneficial insects. Um, these, this iridescent predatory beetle here is a great predator of slugs, and it does very well in overpositioning in the fall in the alfalfa forage. Um, but these are also, some of these are species that are insect and seed predators, weed seed predators. And so diversifying a crop rotation is the cornerstone of IPM. And this is another way to get a synergy with these continuous con diversified crops for um, IPM. We also use practices to protect those actual enemies. So we minimize using insecticides, we scout the alfalfa, we've only typically had to spray the alfalfa once a year, sometimes twice, to minimize killing beneficial insects. Um, and when we had an armyworm outbreak in the rye silage, we used a pheromone disruptor, Intrepid, that you know, is not gonna kill every uh, beneficial insect out there, it's just very targeted to the caterpillars, the armyworms. We have found without BT that our corn rootworms never get above the economic threshold and they actually, in just four years, you see the scale is a tenth lower, dramatically declined. Um, and so we, we really have not needed to do things for European corn borer or rootworm. And um, we have found a number of strategies to diversify weed control. We're banding um, herbicides over the crop rows, and cultivating in between the rows. When we've done that, we could reduce the herbicide use by about 75% in the corn. Doesn't work so well in the soybeans, we've learned. The soy corn, it worked very well, and that can save, oh, I think it was 
uh, $70 per acre um, and, and herbicide use in the corn. So we have these diverse rotations that achieve um, more ways to use the manure to tie up the nutrients and more um, opportunities to enhance soil health and use IPM. And those, I think, are really some of the strategies that we can encourage farmers to use today that are going to help them be more resilient, potentially more profitable, um, in, in light of these challenges of climate change. Um, and these are some of the things that we found in these first six to eight years. There are a lot of system synergies that I really believe are synergies for climate resilience and adaptation that I think we want to keep helping farmers think about from the IPM to the soil health to the more feed to tying up more of the manure to protect water quality. And in, in overview, these are some of the points I've tried to highlight as opportunities that I see for climate resilience in, in the Northeast dairy farming systems and other cropping systems. And I do think there are a couple things that are at the bottom here of, I would want to highlight. I think we do need to keep promoting IPM to prevent resistance and to avoid some of the uh, marketing of products like neonicotinoids that are actually not really helping in many cases and cost farmers more. I think we need to work with dairy nutritionists to help them work with more diverse types of forages and feeds. Triticale, you know, is being promoted, which is great. We've just been using rye, but triticale is even better quality. And many nutritionists are starting to understand that that can be a good quality forage. Um, but sorghum pseudangrass, brown midrib sorghum pseudangrass that has low lignin, all of these things are opportunities. And I really hope we can help farmers network about these practices and um, work together, you know, to get the word out with seed dealers and all of these other support people who I think could market some new opportunities with double cropping and things, but we have to help them be informed about these uh, opportunities.